My name is Andrew Phelps and I'm honored to serve as the president of the Evangelism Society for the Master's College this year and I'm here with Tony Miano, one of our guest speakers. So I'm going to ask him a few questions on evangelism. Um, first question is, what is your current involvement in evangelism with your ministry? Well, evangelism is a way of life for me. Uh, I get up, I eat, breathe, I sleep. Evangelism, that's what I do as a full-time ministry. It encompasses a number of different things, open-air preaching, uh, distribution of tracts, uh, evangelism in malls, evangelism outside of uh, abortion clinics, and anywhere there might be a crowd, anywhere that I might be able to get people to listen to the proclamation of the gospel. And what would you say is the primary biblical motive for a Christian to do evangelism? Uh, the two greatest commandments. The two great commandments are the only motivation a Christian needs to share the gospel with the lost. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he has commanded us to go and proclaim the gospel to all the world. There is no greater way I can show love to God than setting aside love for self to go out and love others by proclaiming his gospel. And there's no greater love I could show to a human being than to warn them about God's wrath to come and to point them to the only Savior who could forgive their sin and save their lives. What? Obviously, we need to understand the distinction between the law and the gospel to properly proclaim the gospel. So what is that distinction? Well, the law is not the gospel. The law is not part of the gospel. Sometimes people confuse that. Uh, there have been times when I've asked people to share the gospel with me, and they'll start by... Um, going over the law with me, going over the Ten Commandments. Well, the Ten Commandments is not part of the Gospel. Uh, the commandments were given to show, one, that we are incapable of keeping them, and two, showing us our need for a Savior. The law of God is what closes the mouth of the unbeliever, and the law of God is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The Gospel, of course, is that way of salvation, that uh, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, fully God and fully man and without sin, lived a perfect life, died a death on the cross he did not deserve, and three days later rose from the grave forever defeating sin and death. And what's the, what's the importance of Christ's Lordship in terms of our method for evangelism? Well, I think one of the reasons why many Christians don't share the gospel is that even though they say God is sovereign, they don't actually believe that God is sovereign. Uh, because of man-centered methods within American evangelicalism, because of some rather poor theology uh, that leads people to think that man somehow has a hand in his own salvation. Uh, many Christians won't share the gospel because they feel if they can't get a decision, if they can't convince someone to pray a prayer, they've somehow failed in evangelism. Uh, sometimes uh, Christians will try to get involved in things like friendship evangelism and other things like that, doing it well intended. You know, certainly nothing sinister about their desire to make friends with lost people, not at all. But many Christians have been led to believe that God needs them, that God needs their dynamic personality, that God needs their benevolence, that God needs their ability to make friends with others in order for the gospel to have any real power. But yet the Word of God says that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also, also to the Greek. And when I, when I began to study the sovereignty of God, when I began to comprehend to an extent, to the extent a fallible man can comprehend the sovereignty of God, that removed all the pressure that I was placing on myself to go out and do evangelism. Uh, I, I felt like I had to be successful. I felt like I had to be effective. I, I felt like I had to have so many notches in my spiritual belt of people I convinced to pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart and, and I would go out and see no success and figure I failed and I wouldn't do it again. But when I realized that God is sovereign over all things and that salvation is of the Lord and only of the Lord, then all I had to do was go out and love God and love people. All I had to do was go out and share the gospel, speaking the truth in love, being obedient to God's command to do that. And through that I learned that the only time I fail in evangelism is when I fail to evangelize. Uh, if I walk up to someone and hand them a track and they tear it in two, that was a successful witnessing encounter because I put the gospel in that person's hand. How a person responds does not determine either the right or wrong of what I'm doing or the success of what I'm doing. If I'm being loving and I'm being obedient to God's call to share the gospel with every person, 
then regardless of the outcome, it was a successful witnessing encounter. Uh, you know, people will ask me, how many people have you led to Christ? I say, everybody I talk to. I take them right up to the foot of the cross, and I trust in a sovereign God to either save that person or not. But my work is done when I open my mouth and speak the truth and love to that lost person. And how, in terms of using the law, like you mentioned, as a schoolmaster to lead people to Christ, how do you use the law to stress um, the sinfulness of man so they see their need for Christ? Well, it's by holding the law up in front of them as a mirror. Uh, you know, I could, I could take the Ten Commandments and two tablets and crack them over someone's skull and beat the law into them, but that's not going to be very loving. So what I'll do is I will use the law in such a way as to hold it up in front of a person as a mirror, simply by asking questions like, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever taken God's name in vain? This way I'm not calling them a liar. I'm not calling them an adulterer. I'm not calling them a blasphemer. They're admitting that to themselves. And they're basically verbalizing what they already know. Every human being knows that God exists. Every human being knows that they've sinned against Him. Every human being knows they will stand before Him to give an account. But man will try to replace God and, and that conviction over sin with philosophy and other religions and, and what have you. But in their heart, as, as depraved and as wicked as their heart is, they know that God exists and they know that they've sinned against Him. So by using the law in evangelism, I'm simply bringing to the surface what a person already knows in their heart about themselves. And in terms of the relationship between apologetics and evangelism, there's a lot of methodologies out there. What is the right use of apologetics in showing that sinners are suppressing the truth of the God they do know and not merely as some problem of ignorance that just don't have enough evidence? Yeah, I, uh, I once used to rely on evidences uh, when sharing the gospel. Uh, you know, the analogies, uh, if I were to uh, bury the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars and I painted one red and I threw it out there in the middle of Texas somewhere and I put a blindfold around you and I sent you out to find that one red half dollar and on the first try you picked it up. That's the possibility of Jesus fulfilling 300 prophecies. Okay, well, that's not going to lead anybody to repent and believe the gospel because it's not the gospel. You see, whatever you win a person with, that's what you're going to have to keep using to keep them. So if you try to win someone with evidences, you're going to have to keep giving them evidences because they've put their faith in evidence. And soon as someone comes around with a different kind of evidence that might be sweeter to their ear, or a kind of evidence that might be more appealing to them, they're going to abandon what faith they said they had in Christ for another kind of evidence that they prefer. That's why presuppositional apologetics, I believe, is the most biblical form. Presuppositional apologetics presupposes that God is and all of His Word is true. So many times Christians will play God's defense attorney in the unbeliever's blasphemous courtroom. They say they believe the Word of God, and I don't doubt that they do, but they say they believe God's Word, and God's Word in Romans 1 says that there are no atheists, there are no agnostics, there are no uh, skeptics, there are simply people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. But yet, the Christian saying he believes that chapter in Romans 1 will then turn and engage a self-professed atheist in a conversation and let the atheist dictate the terms and, and, and uh, submits to the atheist's whim to try to present tr proofs that God exists. So what the, what the Christian does at that point is they set aside their standard, they set aside their authority, the Word of God, and they let the atheist stand on his. Christians should never give up the authority of God's Word. You know, when, when, uh, when, a, when an atheist says, hey, uh, I'll talk to you about this, but you can't bring up the Bible, that would be me, like me saying to a paleontologist, hey, I'll talk to you about dinosaurs, but you can't use fossils, right? It's, it's ridiculous, but yet that's what many Christians do. See, I, I enter every conversation knowing that the person I'm talking to knows that God exists. I never argue with anybody about the existence of God. I never play God's defense attorney in their blasphemous courtroom. I assert truth. I assert the truth that God is and His word is true and every man has been found to be a liar. And I don't let them off that hook. I don't, I don't give way uh, to their straw man arguments. I don't give way to their uh, godless worldviews because the moment a person like that tries to assert any kind of moral 
uh, benchmark, moral guideline or barometer, they have to step into my Christian worldview to try to support that belief that they have any morality. Because if they insist that God doesn't exist, which of course they know is not true, if they insist that God doesn't exist, then we're all just brain fizz. You know, the, our, our feelings mean nothing, our emotions mean nothing, morals mean nothing, logic means nothing. We're just random particles bumping into each other and we happen to be those particles that speak. So presuppositional apologetics, again, begins with the construct that God is true, that every man is a liar, and that God does not need to be proven, God needs to be submitted to. And what would you say to professing believers who maybe lack a burden for the lost? They just go to church and go through the motions, but they don't really see it as that important to go out and do evangelism. Yeah, I, the first thing I would say to them is what Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourself, test yourself to see if you are even in the faith. And that causes many Christians to gasp. I was that way once too. Uh, I pastored a church plant with what I thought was a zeal for reaching the lost, but it was a zeal for preaching about reaching the lost and encouraging my tender little flock to go out there and reach the lost with the gospel that I've been preaching to them. But I was more concerned about crafting the next a great sermon than I was about where people were going to spend eternity. And I had to examine myself, I had to test myself to see if I was in, even in the faith. How could I say that I love God if I don't care where people are going to spend eternity? More so, how could I say that I love people if I don't care where they're going to spend eternity? And if, if I hate another human being so much that I wouldn't proclaim the gospel with them, then God sees me as a murderer and no murderer enters into the kingdom of heaven. So if, if I talk to a person who professes faith in Jesus Christ but they have no desire to proclaim the gospel, uh, then I encourage them to question themselves, uh, to seek the Lord in prayer, to see if they've ever truly repented and believed the gospel. And in terms of the relationship between evangelism and the local church and also discipleship. For example, on YouTube, there's a lot of people that are more of you described as nomads where they go around, they're not under any church eldership or any authority. So what is the importance of the local church in terms of evangelism and connecting that with the next step in discipling? Well, there, we have no examples really in, uh, certainly in the New Testament or anywhere else in the Word of God where evangelism was taking place outside the context of the local church. Uh, even Philip, when he was transported by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip was a serving deacon in the first church of Jerusalem. He, he, was, he was an involved member in his local church and he was doing the work of an evangelist in direct connection with that. Also, all of the evangelism we see in the book of Acts is all in direct relation to planting churches, to building churches. Uh, there, there was no view of simply going out and preaching and preaching the gospel uh, with no view of uh, seeing those people who come to faith in Christ being discipled and being plugged in to, uh, to a local church. And, and you're right, there are a lot of people out there who are out there proclaiming what they think is the gospel, many of them aren't. But there are those who are out there actually proclaiming a genuine gospel but they completely ignore the responsibility to, to make disciples. You see that, and on the flip side of that, there are people who say, well, the Great Commission is all about, is all about discipleship. And it has nothing to do with evangelism. I've heard that too. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, in, in the Greek, there in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, uh, the, the verb, the command, is to make, to make disciples. The go is not uh, a command. The go, uh, if you were to most literally translate it in the Greek, Jesus is saying, as you are going, make disciples. Jesus presumes that if you are one of his followers, you are out doing the work of evangelism. And as you evangelize the lost, as you are going, proclaiming the gospel, and people come to faith in Christ, Christ you are discipling them. You are teaching them all that Jesus commanded them and seeing that they are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we, we can't look at evangelism in a vacuum. We can't look at discipleship in a vacuum. They are two sides of the same coin. They are, are both necessary 
uh, in the Great Commission work, first seeing people come to repentance and faith in Christ, and then seeing that they're discipled. If you can't do that yourself, doing whatever you can to see that they're plugged into a, a biblical church so that they can receive the discipleship they need. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate your support and willingness to help teach with some of the evangelism and just to equip the students here at the Master's College and as well as other believers with your ministry. So thanks a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.